what might plants feel? Well, there's an endless debate uh, whether or not plants are conscious. Um, I'm not really going to get into that. But let's just say, for the sake of argument, um, that we don't rule out the possibility of plants being conscious. Uh, or plants having some sort of consciousness. I wouldn't um, ask the question, what might a plant feel? What might plants feel? I'd say, or I'd ask, what um, might plants feel like? <laughs> what might the experience of being a plant be like? Now, this really sort of gets off the beaten track uh, in many ways. Um, in other words, I've often said that I have no idea what it means to be another human being. I don't know what their experience is like, and probably if I could see the world through their the filter of all their experiences and all their prejudices and all their presuppositions and everything, it would probably frighten me. It would be so alien. Um, and that could be anybody. That could be somebody I've known all my life and I know better than anyone else if I actually saw the universe, the world, everything through their eyes, through the filter of everything they are, all their experiences, it would probably be so different that it would have some sort of profound effect on me actually might not frighten me. My, I might sort of go, oh my God, I've been living in hell all my life and this person's living in paradise. I don't know. Now, how much more different must it be uh, to be a plant? Uh, now, this kind of gets, as I say, weird. It, uh, it shoots off the scale. It really gets off uh, any sort of known uh, means of looking into things. But this is where I think that reason can overshoot um, just the scientific method. This is where I think that our ability to sort of, hmm, what would it be like, and what would their experiences be like, um, even though we have absolutely no way of really investigating this. And I mentioned in a few other videos, or perhaps just in some comments, that I think that um, we may have reached, in many ways, the limits of the usefulness of our tools, science, mathematics, assumptions like time and space, and uh, this sort of thing. Um, they may actually have sort of gone as far as they can and not answered some questions that we can logically continue to ask using our reason. Well. This might not be for everybody, but this is why I think that so many, uh, what we might call, I don't know, nerdy people are into science fiction, is that science fiction can actually, or fiction in general, or whatever you want to call this kind of speculative fiction, um, can actually bring our reason beyond the point of what science is capable of explaining or verifying. For example, I mentioned the novels of Stephen King. He, more than anyone else I know, although I'm not much of a science fiction reader, is very good at putting us inside the minds of very odd things, different things, either insane people. In the novel Cujo, he puts us inside the mind of an animal, its experiences. In I Am the Doorway, he shows us what it might be like to have the same consciousness as something that is utterly alien to you. Um, in so many different ways, he sort of brings us into other people's experiences, their experiences themselves. He deconstructs the stream of consciousness that takes place in someone else's mind. That is just one author. He's a popular and a highly accessible author, and that's probably why I've come across him. Um, but there are, I'm sure, many other authors that have done this. Now, the problem with all of this is, of course, it's all fiction. <laughs> um, which is, you know, another way of saying that it's all just rubbish. It never happened. It's not verifiable and it's meaningless, essentially. It's just great fun, but what can we learn from it? Oh, I believe that we can learn a lot from it. Because if we can't actually find out what another person feels like using the scientific method, verifiable, falsifiable information, 
it doesn't mean that this person doesn't feel anything. What this means is, all that we've done is we've pointed out, there goes my cat again, all that we've done is we've pointed out the limitations of our tools. We have to remember that reality is what it is, regardless of our ability to understand or measure it. It, 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 it's not enough to simply call somebody who's speculating on issues such as those I'm speculating on a solipsist. <laughs> Regardless of what I am, the underlying reality of what I'm attempting to probe isn't changed a bit. <laughs> you, you can call me anything. You can call me a Nazi or whatever. Or you know, I, And I don't mean that, that people are doing this maliciously. What I'm saying is, it's not enough to simply say solipsism is a dead end, so we'll just forget about it. And anything that we don't really understand, we put in that box that we call solipsism. That's like the old term, heresy. Now, I'm not making a case for solipsism. It's just that this is a term that a lot of people want to seem to apply to me. Same thing with like nihilism. I get called that a lot. I, I sincerely do not understand these, what I call, charges against me, because I'm far from that. What I'm saying is we have to recognize the limits of our tools, the limits of our ability to measure things in a way that we've become used to measuring things. Experiences cannot be measured scientifically. They can't be measured the way that we're used to measuring things. We have to get a new set of tools. Now, this is not to say that this is meant to justify anything. In, in other words, somebody might object that, oh yeah, okay, so you're saying that because I believe that um, people are out to kill me, that if I try to kill them, I'm acting in self-defense and that I should be treated as such if it comes before a judge. Well, no, <laughs> I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is we have to come up, if you ask me, with some sort of discipline to try and reason our way into places that um, our present tools cannot take us. This does not mean that we now have the right to act on whatever experience we happen to decide, unilaterally as it were, is phenomenally real. Any more than if I find out, say, oh, um, if I uh, mix these two chemicals together, they explode, it automatically gives me a right to do this. Um, or we could even say, in the scientific sort of way of looking at things, there's no such thing as rights. Things just happen, you know. Um, the, things just are. We could look at this reasoning thing uh, in the same way. The speculation going beyond the limits of uh, our present scientific outlook. And another objection that has come up is, well, what's the point? Who cares if we go beyond this? Who cares if we if we learn anything that's beyond the reach of science. How are we going to store that knowledge? How are we going to quantify it? How are we going to uh, place it in a, in a recognizable uh, series of, um, uh, of writings, as it were, or some sort of canon like the rules of physics, the laws of physics or something like that? How are we going to get into that? Well, I would counter that with who says that anything has any inherent value, anything at all. Uh, science? So what? It's going to... What, what ultimately is science going to accomplish? It, it'll do a whole bunch of things and then, okay, we've done those things and now what? <laughs> uh, whatever value we place on that is exactly that, the value that we place on it. So if we engage in a bunch of pointless speculations that don't go anywhere or that look like they're not going anywhere and they've gone off all the maps and, and uh, we can't really catalog them the way we can scientific ones. What's the point? What's the use? Well, okay. What's the use of getting out of bed in the morning? <laughs> Thank you.